We're ready to start. My name is Matt Barreto. I am a professor of political science and Chicano studies at UCLA. I'm also the faculty director of the UCLA Latino Politics and Policy Initiative, LPPI. And today we're going to be having a discussion about engaging, mobilizing, and serving our immigrant communities here in Los Angeles, which could not come at a more important time as we uh, deal with so many pressing issues from the census to elections to, of course, response to the coronavirus. Um, before we get started with our um, panelists, who I'll introduce in just a moment, I'd like to start out by uh, a few minutes, just a brief introductory comments from Efrain Escobedo, who is a longtime supporter and a colleague uh, who has given generous support to make this uh, series happen from the California Community uh, Foundation. Uh, Efrain Escobedo is a vice president in charge of education and immigration programs at CCF. He's had an extensive career dedicated uh, to increasing civic engagement and ensuring uh, public policies and institutions are responsive to our communities of color and our immigrant communities. He has worked both nationally and locally to increase citizenship, voter participation, the census, and he's a nationally recognized leader who is active in the Latino and civic engagement policy. Prior to joining CCF, Escobedo was the manager of governmental and legislative affairs at the Registrar of Voters here in Los Angeles County. So he knows his way around voting systems and voting technologies as well. And prior to that, he served as the Senior Director of Civic Engagement for the National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials, NALEO. Um, so with that, let me introduce Efrain Escobedo, who is a good friend of mine and a great supporter of the research and policy advocacy that we're doing for some opening comments and to frame this uh, discussion as we move uh, before we turn it over and welcome our two panelists. Efrain. Thank you, Matt, and good morning, everyone. It's great to see you, amigo. And a uh, pleasure to be here. Always a pleasure to continue to be a partner of the Institute, a partner of the Luskin School and UCLA, and the great work you all do in not just uh, conducting research, but in helping to catalyze action, particularly around policy issues that impact communities of color, and particularly our Latino communities here in California, and particularly Los Angeles County. We're very proud to uh, be able to be part of this conversation and excited about the tremendous leaders uh, who you'll hear from today. I think that when we look at the, the session's title today, uh, there is no more critical conversation to be having in a time when not only have we seen the impacts of anti-immigrant and xenophobic uh, policies coming out of Washington, D.C., and the impacts they have had on our uh, immigrant communities. But now, even with this pandemic and the ravages and disproportionate impact that it's having in our communities, the conversation around what is the level of voice and power that immigrant communities have and contribute to not just our democratic processes, but to the resiliency of our economy could not be uh, more timely than, than now. I think today we'll, we'll hear great conversations to really understand about the importance of having a voice in our immigrant communities, mobilizing our immigrant communities to affect change around a broken immigration system that continues to deport and separate thousands uh, of families, to how our state policies can advance greater equity in our communities from uh, affording relief around COVID-19 to also enacting more equitable policies that expand health care uh, in our communities, as well as expand the voice of our communities at a very local level. So I think today this conversation will be an extremely catalytic one in helping us think about how we continue to focus on the critical uh, energy that needs to be put behind not just thinking about or, or looking at our immigrant communities, but listening to them and more importantly, mobilizing and building stronger voice and power in these communities. So thank you again, Matt, for your continued efforts and the center's continued efforts. And we look forward to a continued partnership with you and also all of our good friends on the panel. 
All right, thank you, Efrain. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you joining us today and for your leadership in supporting this. Um, the California Community Foundation has been a longtime supporter of uh, the Luskin School of Public Affairs, and, and uh, we thank you for that commitment. Uh, and we know that you are especially grateful for that as a USC alum, anytime you can help contribute to UCLA. So thank you for that. Um, let me now turn to um, our esteemed panelists. I'm going to start um, with Angela Casalas, and then I will turn over to Jenny Carrion. I will introduce each of them uh, in turn, and we'll have a short uh, presentation uh, from each of them. And then I'll ask a couple of questions, and then we'll just open it up to your questions. Uh, you can also put your questions in the question queue so that uh, you can get those ready, and we'll see those, and we'll uh, read those out. Angela Casalas is the executive director of the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights of Los Angeles, commonly known as CHIRLA. It is a widely regarded as one of the most gifted and activist organizers in the country today. You have probably seen her name in the news a lot recently uh, as the California Resilience Fund has uh, just started and CHIRLA has been at the forefront of that. Since becoming CHIRLA's director in 1999, Salas has spearheaded and won several ambitious campaigns. She helped win in-state tuition and access to financial aid for undocumented students. And most recently, she helped win driver's licenses for undocumented community in California. She is also a leading national spokesperson and organizer on federal immigration policy and was very involved uh, during the attempts to pass comprehensive immigration reform to make sure that that was done in a fair, humane, and equitable way. One of her greatest accomplishments as Churla has been the transformation of a social service provision coalition into a statewide mass membership organization that empowers immigrants to engage in advocacy on their own behalf. Um, Angelica, thank you for joining us today. I'd now like to turn it over to you to share some um, uh, comments, some uh, data, some perspectives on what Chirla is doing right now, the important work that you're doing. Uh, and before we turn it over to Jenny next, uh, I'll have a few questions for you, but please, uh, you have the floor. Thank you again for joining us today and making time for this session. Thank you so very much, Matt, and thank you to the Luskin School for having us and for having the conversation uh, at this very moment. I wanted to talk today about what we're doing uh, to mobilize the immigrant vote um, across uh, California, but also um, engaged in other states as well. Um, and so I begin um, the conversation with um, our first slide um, in terms of our, um, our, our work. So Chula has a, um, what we call the Immigrant Political Power um, Project. And are having a little difficulty here. There you go. Um, so the Immigrant Political Power Project. And the Immigrant Political Project seeks to engage um, the following in, uh, individuals. Um, low, what, what people deem low propensity Latino voters um, and also new American voters and their children. Um, we believe that we have the power to change the rea our reality if we vote. Um, so we, of course, at Chirla are known as we advance the human and the civil rights of immigrants and refugees to mobilize in the streets, um, to uh, protest that which is wrong um, at the local, state, and, um, and federal level, especially at the federal level, because so much harm has been done to our communities. But we believe that um, in addition to mobilizing in the streets, we have to mobilize to the polls. So Chirla started its um, immigrant political project in 2004, um, founded the Mobilize the Immigrant Vote campaign, and then um, began working on this campaign in order to move our folks. What I want to do is share with you some of the um, information that we share with our leaders, many of them who become volunteers um, to motivate them to in, um, engage their families as well. Um, so we begin first by saying, you know, the voting does not look like us. Um, the people who are voting are not going to vote for the things that matter to us because they are not us. And so what we need to do is to continue to grow the power of our community. And that um, while our power is growing in, um, at, the, uh, at the ballot box, it still has not been enough to win immigration reform, um, to bring justice um, to our communities. 
And when we mean justice, we mean better schools, we mean um, access to healthcare so that we have clinics that actually are able to support us and healthcare that is actually available for us. Because for many immigrants, access to healthcare is just out of reach, not just because their employers don't offer it, but because they're undocumented and don't have access to much of that care. Um, and um, what we also um, uh, tell our community is that our community, that people are seeing that our power is growing and that that's changing their perspective about us. And so that we need to continue to um, turn out at record, um, at record numbers. Um, and that we also, as um, Latinos and immigrants, and many immigrants, of course, coming from various parts of the world, um, so um, that our participation is growing and it's growing with our allies and our um, and other people of color. And so that in this process of voting, that we have to be part of a mosaic of power. Um, and so this is really important for us because a lot of the work that we do in mobilizing the vote is actually with um, partner organizations as well. Um, and then the other thing that we um, uh, express is that immigrants vote. Immigrants are voting, um, that they're voting, that naturalized citizens um, are, are, are voting and that they're making a difference in certain battleground uh, states and that that is why at the federal level, uh, a lot of attacks have come into nat uh, to naturalization because they know that if an immigrant then becomes a citizen and that citizen registers to vote and votes for the first time, their participation is gonna be constant. And so that in many instances, immigrants, naturalized citizens are voting much more um, than, um, than even the um, Native American Latinos, um, Native American, and, and Native, Native, um, uh, uh, Native born Asians, so Native, um, Native born uh, Latinos. So this is important for folks to know because part of what we do with our members and our volunteers is go to naturalization ceremonies and make sure um, that individuals are registered to vote right there as soon as they, they've taken their oath, um, their oath um, to become a citizen of the United States, that very quickly that they're registered to vote and that we engage them in the immigrant political power project that seeks to educate them about the issues and actually provide them very important information. And um, the one thing that we also talk about, and because this is a family outreach program, is that our kids are not voting. Our children, who are the sons and daughters of immigrants, are not voting at the rates they should. So half the Californians, um, half of Californians, 18 to 24, are either an immigrant or a child of an immigrant. So many of them, if they become citizens or if they are the children of of immigrants are actually not, you know, their parents never voted. So many times that means that that is not, you know, that is not um, something that that has been part of the family, you know, dynamic or of, of the custom. Um, and we, uh, costumbres in Espanol, right? Uh, so we want to make sure that, um, that especially those who are undocumented, um, those who are um, uh, LPRs really tell their U.S. citizen children to engage in the voting process and help them through the process and how important that is. Um, and so the challenge in California um, we is, is so much about, again, the representation that I began with. So in California, 45% of the Latino adult citizens are voting, 53% of Asian American adult citizens are voting, 57% of African Americans adults are voting, uh, and that's not necessarily in representation of the of the of the people of the demographics. And so, 68% um, of non-Hispanic white adults are are the most likely in our state most likely voter population. And it's and so we need to understand that we need to ex expand that electorate by being part of that electorate. Um, so um, now getting to sort of the, the field work. So well, for CHIRLA, a part of our Immigrant Political Power Project is to turn out voters. So in 2018, two, um, CHIRLA was able to turn out to the polls 253,000 voters in California and some sprinkled into other states. Um, when our turnout data came back, we noticed that these so-called low propensity voters and new American voters were actually voting at 11 to 13 percent um, higher turnout um, than even uh, the state's turnout. So we know this; uh, it works, but what, what will make it work is if we invest in it. 
So for 2020, such a critical year for immigrant communities, our goal is to turn out to the polls 318,960 voters, um, both on primary and in the general election. But we also have a major um, issue um, when it comes to um, uh, this moment in terms of COVID and, and, um, and our folks turning out at this moment. And part of that is that uh, we need to do massive education for our community in terms of um, the uh, a vote by mail process and even to, under, to explain to them, <clears throat> excuse me, how it is that voting is going to be taking place in November of 2020. And so I just wanted, we did a survey of um, about 243 of our um, voters, our voter in our in our Chirla voter file. And what we found is most people who did not vote, because we went to those voters, we said, why didn't you vote? And they said, we didn't even know that it was election day. Um, I had to work. Um, you know, the, the location that I was supposed to vote, um, vote at no longer existed. That had to do with a lot of the vote, voter centers are closed early. Um, and then when we asked them what would make it easier, they talk about um, definitely are saying, you know, call us, let me know, remind me. And the last piece, which I think is very important, is that people do prefer to vote in person. Um, and much more so than voting by mail. But given this moment, we're going to have to do so much work to make sure that people have all the right tools to vote by mail, to be safe, to have safe elections, and that we really work with them in this moment um, so that they are not, um, they, that they make the decision to vote. Um, and we've been at it. Um, uh, so this is, you know, in 2008, uh, these are some of our folks. Some of them were at the White House after the election, but our young people who are helping us get out the vote. And we believe that if we want, we need to vote in order to get the um, ear of our elected officials. Um, the stakes are high. Our lives, certainly COVID-19, but our lives beyond that, too many people dying at our borders, too many children incarcerated. So we need immigration reform and justice at the local level, schools and communities. We need more revenue for our communities. And then, of course, democracy and really defining our nation, whether it's a nation of inclusion or it's a nation of exclusion. And um uh, we know that things can change, and we always get reminded of what the legacy of Proposition 187 was. In 1994 in California, 1.4 million Latinos were registered to vote. By 2019, 4 million Latinos registered to vote. We think that, you know, activating our folks through a political lens can really lead them to those to the polls. I'm going to quickly finish by just saying these are our folks. This is the motor of, of our program. Our community that is getting out to vote um, is, is motivated by their peers. And we're getting the attention of our political leaders. And this last one, there's no partisanship here. It's just to say that, you know, this is a, 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 a moment in which some of um, DACA is up, up uh, to the Supreme Court. And so this was our leaders engaging um, Vice President Biden in a call for renewals of DACA, even as we wait for the Supreme Court. And then finally, together we want to win in 2020. These are, are some of our youngest activists at, at Chirla, and so we do all this work for them. Um, and with that, I'm going to um, turn it back to Matt and um, and just and our fellow uh, the rest of our fellow prisoners. Great, thanks, Angelica. That was really uh, powerful. It's going to make a nice transition to the important work that you're doing. Uh, at uh, Chirla, as well as the work that uh, Jenny is doing at uh, Ultimate. So uh, I have some questions. I'm going to save those until uh, after Jenny presents, because I know we have a lot of synergies here with similar work. So I'm now going to introduce uh, Jenny Carrion, who is the Assistant Vice President for Civic Engagement at Ultimate, which delivers 1 million annual patients through its 50 sites across Los Angeles and Orange County. You've probably seen one of their community clinics all across uh, the area. She is also a founder and executive director of Ultimate's PAC and oversees fundraising and the endorsement process for elected officials in all levels of office for state of California. She works very closely with Ultimate CEO and SVP. Jenny actively participates in multiple phases of civic engagement and community empowerment and power building initiative. 
She creates and implements strategies to achieve Ultimate's political priorities and represents the company to promote eliminating disparities in healthcare across underserved communities. Uh, prior to joining Ultimate, Jenny served as senior advisor to Mayor Antonio Villaragosa. In this position, she served as a liaison to environmental officials, business groups, as well as state, local, and national elected officials. Uh, she was also on the Governor uh, Gray Davis's uh, team of international relations and worked under the Secretary of Foreign Affairs with an emphasis on Latin America. Uh, in her uh, capacity at Ultimate, she is uh, overseeing their direct civic engagement and get out the vote strategy. Uh, and um, we have also worked closely with Jenny and Ultimate over uh, the years. And so it's a real pleasure to welcome her to this panel uh, and hear about the important work that Ultimate is doing. Uh, Jenny, go ahead. Thank you, Matt, um, and thank you for including us um, in, in today's conversation. Um, we're very excited to be part of this conversation today, especially in, in the COVID-19 era. Um, and we know that every time there's a difficult conversation um, happening in Sacramento or in DC, the first thing that is cut is healthcare and women's rights. So Altima has moved from the theory of just registering people to vote to actually taking time to, um, to teach them the mechanics of how to vote. We have 50 locations in LA and Orange County and um, have been doing this work for close to 50 years. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the campaigns that we've been running here. Just wanna make sure you guys can see them. Um, Can we see them? It's not showing up on mine, so. Yeah, I think that's working. Okay, thank you. Um, Ultimate started uh, close to 50 years ago in East LA as a barrio free clinic. Um, started in the health and in the center of the heart of, of the Latino community during the civil rights movement, demanding for healthcare access for our most vulnerable populations. From that, now we have moved to being the largest healthcare provider in the country. And when we think about healthcare disparities and eliminating the social determinants of, of health, we know that civic engagement is tied to people's well being. We know that. Um, most likely the people, our community members that are not voting are those that are suffering from the most healthcare disparities. So Ultimate switched our, our roles um, and shifted our priorities um, to doing voter integrated engagement. And this is a model that now lives in at Ultimate, our organization, and it's systematic to every point of contact with our patients. So it's not just putting a Facebook ad out. It's not just you know putting a poster up, but it's an actual um, model that every step of a patient experience at our clinics um, or at all of our centers, the, somebody is talking to talking to them about the importance of the election. Um, we had. I'm going to share a couple of slides about some of the work that we did um, last year. Um, excuse me, in, in 2018, when we contacted over 235,000 low propensity voters. And like, um, uh, like uh, what we're talking about earlier is most campaigns only focus on high propensity voters. I've been a, a political strategist for close to 20 years, and we have seen that campaigns just don't have the resources and to talk to everyone. So what's the easy thing to do? The easy thing to do is talk to just high propensity voters. So Altamed wanted to shift that around and our focus is strictly on low propensity voters. Many of them look like all of our patients. So we established this five touch model where um, we call you know, all of our local patients and community members, we knock on their doors, um, we send them information at, you know, during our cl clinic visits, and, um, and then we actually take them on election day to go vote. And some of the, um, some of the results that, that we, have, we have been able to see have been really, um, really impressive. And I know we've been working with UCLA and Matt's team to get the data out um, that really certifies that the notion that Latinos are not interested in voting is incorrect. It's that it, 
nobody has ever taken the time to talk to us and to teach us about the mechanics, the how-tos, where do you go, who are you, what do these propositions mean? Um, because you know, one proposition one day sounds like a good thing and another day it sounds like a terrible thing. So breaking all of that down, um, we've been able to really achieve some, some remarkable um, a voter turnout in some of the precincts that nobody has really been talking to. Um, we have about 40 organizers um, that work with us, and these are our promotoras and, and folks that know the community, that know what time you're gonna be home, um, and you know have, have the access and resources to educate you and to educate our most vulnerable um, populations about what issues are important to you. Right now, um, healthcare in our community is the most, you know, it's, it's a very hot topic. Obviously, we're in the middle of a pandemic, but we know that our doctors are a number one trusted messenger. So when our doctors are wearing pins that say, get out to vote, or el censo es muy importante para tu salud, that resonates. Um, and we're seeing that, you know, in our waiting rooms, we'll have commercials playing about the election and about the census. We'll have sample ballots. Um, we have, uh, when a doctor gives a patient a prescription, below the prescription information, it says, you know, uh, make sure to, to get counted on the census and so forth. Um, one of the, one of the, um, results that we're mostly proud of um, is the results that we saw in the Sela region. So these are some examples of some of our highest um, achieving uh, precincts that we that we worked in. Um, and some of these precincts, like in Southgate, you're seeing here, there's a 400, excuse me, 307% change from the, the election results four years ago. Now, prospectively, that number is really impressive. But what that tells you is that in 2014, only 71 people voted, where in 2018, 378 people voted. That's a huge increase, but you know you see that there's still 1,178 eligible voters that did not vote. So while there's a lot of uh, work that we should be very proud of, we still have a lot of work to do um, into get, making sure that that gap is closer to what the actual realistic numbers are. And one of the things that our organizers were saying is, you know, when we were going out to the households um, and, and talking to folks about the importance of voting, no other campaign was going to those households. So, and, and have you, this is in the middle of a presidential campaign where there's organizers and labor unions and, um, and different campaigns going out in the community. But the communities that we were walking in, the, commu the, the households that we were talking to, no one was going to them. And, and actually it's very correct in saying that people didn't even know there was an election. Uh, you know, there's so many things happening right now in our communities that uh, it, it was very obvious that we still have to do a better job at communicating on the importance of why voting is actually gonna impact them and their family members. This past, um, this past election, we were really excited to have actually flex voting centers in our clinics, which you know we were working very diligently with the Alley County Registrar's Office. And it was not an easy task, um, but it was really such an important thing that we did. So all of our pace, pace centers, which is our senior um, clinics where, where our participants stay there for about four hours um, a day, depending on their medical condition, we had flex voting centers happening right then and there. And for the, for the majority of them, of our seniors, it was the first time that they ever voted. And when, uh, you know, there, we got a lot of press attention, media attention on this. And when they were asked, why was it this the first time? They said, no one's ever taken me before. I didn't have a ride or I don't know how to use these machines. Esto que el iPad, que es eso? Um, so it was really exciting to see, uh, you know, all of our most vulnerable populations, our seniors, our abuelitos, our tias, voting for the first time at the comfort of their you know, doctor's visit, so they didn't have to go somewhere else. Um, and we're really proud that LA County had 49 flex voting centers throughout the county, and um, nine of them were at ultimate sites, and we had the highest voter turnout at, at our locations. So it, it, you know, it wasn't the traditional civic engagement locations that we're all familiar with, but it was really the locations that our community members use and they feel um, like they're, they feel that they're safe and they feel that you know their information and someone's gonna actually walk them through the process. 
uh, we also had flex voting at our at our corporate office, and this really helped with management's understanding of the importance of civic engagement and helping us promote it with our 35,000 employees that we have. I'm gonna skip through that one. Um, one of the uh, one of the big one of the big wins for us right now, um, and the items that that we're working with is around the census. Um, you know, it's it's not just is this important for healthcare, but it's so important for all of the wraparound service that our community use and need um, on a daily basis. So we have promotoras at all of our clinics. So when patients are waiting to see their doctor, there's someone there that's able to help them facilitate the computer, facilitate the, you know, what do the different questions mean and actually support in filling this out. You know, LA County, we're still behind the mark in getting um, all of our community members to fill this out. So we really feel like, you know, having someone there available, especially during a pandemic to support is gonna be really important to get those numbers out. At all of our COVID-19 um, evaluation testing centers, we have um, staff there wearing census um, information. We have posters, we have um, fact sheets um, so that when patients are waiting to get tested, they're actually reading information on the census and, and why it's important. All of our materials that we have um, currently are um, can be co-branded. So w the campaigns that we've been running have been in the lowest propensity voter regions, which is San Isidro, LA, um, Orange, Santa Ana, and, and in Oakland. Um, and when we've been talking to health centers about how we can um, make this work easier for them, because not everybody has a political strategist in health, so how can this work be um, easier for them to implement. They said they didn't have the resources to create the model, to create the flyers, the posters, the messaging, the script. So what we did is that we created everything and it lives on our website. Anyone can use it and you can very easily put your logo on it because we understand that while at, in LA County, Altamed is a trusted messenger. In Oakland, it's another organization or another healthcare um, provider as well as different regions in the state. Um, and these are some of the uh, posters and, and information that you see throughout all of our clinics um, and in all of our healthcare centers. And to close, um, I just wanted to plug in that we also have an app. Uh, this app uh, has you know, thousands of, of users and our community members, we encourage them to use it. Um, it allows us to stay connected with our with our community and elected officials. So if there's an issue you know, regarding public charge or a proposition, and, and we want our community members to get activated on it. And to, you know, if we're gonna really change the power dynamics in our community, it's gonna change from a grassroots level. Um, so I encourage you all to please download our app. And we know that, you know, there's a strong correlation between communities' lack of civic participation and health disparities. And we're really proud to be changing that dynamic as we speak. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, I want to invite uh, Angelica to uh, rejoin us if you want to uh, turn your um, cam back on so we can uh, sort of be in conversation now. Thank you both for those great uh, presentations, uh, Jenny and, and Angelica. Um, I want to start just with a question about why focusing on low propensity voters. And this is a question for both of you, but I'll, I'll throw it to Angelica first. Um, most of the time, campaigns look to mobilize people and they want to turn out voters. Um, and we know that not everyone votes. Why and how is your organization targeting low propensity voters? Tell us a little bit about what that means, who is a low propensity voter, and why is it so important uh, that we do work mobilizing those, um, those voters in our community? Well, um, we focus on low propensity voters because we believe it's an issue of equity. Um, when it comes to what are the expenditures in campaigns to do um, education, first and foremost, about what the issues are, and certainly then to mobilize around turnout. And so what happens, I, I feel like we should even call it low propensity voters. We should be um, calling these voters ignored voters, uh, voters that are um, not invested in. Um, and so what we feel is that we're making a decision 
to actually invest in our community, to reach out to them and not ignore them. And so, I, I, um, so for us, it's it's about um, uh, when we say low propensity voters are folks who aren't regularly voting uh, um, during election time. And so many times when we think about, well, who are those who are voting? They're older, um, they're white, um, they're reg and they're and you know many times they're the ones that receive not one call. They're so tired of getting so many robocalls and um, people were showing, you know, especially during the primary um, here in California, we're talking about how they got 10, 20 flyers all in maybe a week about, you know, um, speaking on the issues. And then we have our, our community that gets nothing. And then you wonder mm -hmm. why did they come out to vote? So I always say, well, you're not going to go to a party that you weren't invited to. Um, so that's what we do. And then mm -hmm. how do we reach them? Um, we reach them by phone. Um, we reach them by knocking on doors. So very, very similar um, uh, to um, the description from Altamet and um, calling them multiple times, not once, not twice. And if we can get their cell phone, because most of them are have their cell phone and we're catching them on their drive home after work or on their drive to work or in any other way. And of course, you know, um, doing a lot of earned media that also creates some motivation around what are some of the issues that are that we're talking about. That's why we target um, these low propensity voters as, as they are called. But again, I think that they we should call them, you know, disinvested voters. I mean, they're not they it's not on them. It's on the campaigns. That's great. Uh, thank you, Anhanika. I want to uh, bring Jenny back in for her perspective on this because the ultimate program also is targeting these lower propensity voters. Uh, I will say, though, um, I have showed up at parties I haven't been invited to in the past, though. So sometimes that happens. I don't know. <laughs> uh, maybe that's just me. Um, Jenny, can you talk about those multiple touches, those contacts, about what you're doing in the, you alluded to this, inside even the clinics? And how are you really surrounding these lower propensity voters with, um, with engagement? Yeah. Um, we are focusing on low propensity voters because that's who our patients are. And we see a strong correlation with if we're going to change the power dynamics in our community, it's got to be from the ground up. Um, as I mm -hmm. mentioned before, I know that there's millions of dollars spent on campaigns, but money is not spent on our community. So if nobody else is doing it, then it's our responsibility to do so. Um, so the five touch model in um, inside our clinics, we have a five touch model internally and externally. So internally, once you walk in, there's messaging posters about what the election is coming up in the waiting room. In the waiting room, there's commercials on the computers playing, you know, 10 more days for the election. Sabes donde ir a votar, necesitas esta información. Um, when the receptionist gives the patient um, the insurance information form, there's information there about the election. And we put something that is going to be important that this election cycle regarding healthcare. We always tie everything to healthcare uh, because we're 501c3, so all of our work is nonpartisan. Um, and then before the, the, the fifth touch is when the patient goes and sees their doctor. That's the, the number one trusted messenger. So the doctor mm -hmm. has pin on that talks about the election. Um, you know, my vote, my health is plastered everywhere. And then the prescription to the patient is also included a voting message or a census message. Um, externally, our five touch model and, and, you know, five touch is kind of the, our secret sauce. That's where we see that the change actually happens and getting people to vote versus just telling them once or, or seeing a, um, a, a text message or a Facebook ad. Um, and externally, we, we call them on the phone, we knock on their doors. And what we see, what we're seeing is that there's a higher rate of people opening the doors to us because we have ultimate shirts on, we have ultimate hats on, and, and our community members know us, so they trust us. Um, and you know, when we knock on doors, they're like, "Vienes de la oficina de mi doctor? Like, is everything okay?" <laughs> we're like, "Yes, everything is great. Your doctor says hello, but she also wants me to come talk to you about this election and what it means for your family and what this means for your children." Um, and we've, you know, as you've seen, Matt, we have really seen some wonderful results. There's still a lot more work that we need to do. Um, but uh, we're, we're really proud that, you know, at the end of the day, people are calling us, asking us for rides on Election Day um, and asking us questions on how to be civically engaged outside of just the election, because that's not how we're going to change power. This has to be a year long relationship 
that has multi dimensions and it's more organic versus you know a week before the election. Hey, don't forget there's a there's an election. It just that doesn't sound you know culturally. You know that's not even how we have a relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great, Jenny. Thank you. Um, and it's consistent with what we're hearing from Angelica at Chirla, that these are community-based organizations. They're trusted messengers. And it's really um, important to, to highlight the data that both of you have presented to us that this can work, that you can actually get out these lower propensity so-called voters to the polls if you actually just invest in it. So that's a wonderful, wonderful finding. I want to transition to a, an, another voting question. We've gotten a couple of questions from Christina uh, and Jean and some others on our uh, web chat uh, about vote by mail. And we know that the state of California is taking the COVID-19 very seriously. Uh, that there are orders from the governor and the secretary of state and others to transition to vote by mail. But we also know, and Angelica mentioned this, uh, vote by mail is less used in the Latino community, especially by uh, perhaps these ignored voters who have less experience. What are each of your organizations going to do as we think ahead to November? Uh, if in fact there is a need to really rely on vote by mail, what additional steps do we need to do to uh, get that ready in the Latino community, in the immigrant community, which may have less uh, familiarity with that. Um, I'll start with you, Jenny, since you were just up. Is there anything that you're doing to transition, and then Angelica as well, from the Cherla perspective, to make sure that we can have a proper use of vote by mail in the Latino and immigrant community? Yeah, um, what, the biggest thing that we're doing now is we're starting earlier. Usually we start the campaign about three months into the election, and we're starting the campaign next month. So by next month, we're going to be talking, we're going to have produced videos on what a vote by mail ballot actually looks like, first and foremost. This is what it looks like. This is what the envelope looks like, so that we don't just throw it away um, once we receive it. Um, and we're going to be doing a stronger field campaign that has a stronger education component but with what the vote by mail document actually, the how to's, you know, the 10 fact questions, make sure you sign it at the end, you don't need a postage and so forth. But we're also going to be, um, we're going to we're going to be promoting the flex vote centers at our clinics because like Angelica mentioned, you know, we're our community. Um, that we feel more comfortable voting, you know, at, at the ballot. And, and we might have questions that no one is able to help us out with if we're doing this at home. So it's going to be, you know, I think also this work is not easy um, and it's very labor intensive and it's very expensive. That's why um, a, a lot of organizations don't invest in it or campaigns don't invest in it because it's, it's easier just to, you know, pay millions of dollars and put a commercial out versus taking the time to actually talk to our community and establish a relationship and get the work done. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Angelica, from the Cherla perspective, how are you going to tackle the uh, crisis of uh, vote by mail versus in-person voting? As Jenny mentioned, many people may still prefer the vote centers and early voting, uh, but if the pandemic comes back strongly, uh, we may be advising people to take advantage of vote by mail. What, what are your thoughts and how is uh, Chirla going to plan for something like that here in California? Well, um, first of all, we actually started on um, advocating to make sure that if, you know, yes, vote by mail, but that there were also in-person options. So we also said, mm -hmm. you know, safe and simple and accessible to our community. Um, but we know um, that we need massive education on voter on vote by mail, but it's not just about how the process works, but also to um, demystify the process and also to um, allow people to understand or help people understand that it's also a process in which the vote will be counted. So there's a lot of distrust that if you put it in the mail, it actually will get there. And this has to do with, you know, people's experience in home countries, et cetera. They want to see it you know, they want to see it dropped. And, you know, it's our communities, but other communities too. So what we're going to be doing um, and have already begun is um, a lot of education on vote, on the whole vote by mail process. Um, in the past, um, in the past elections, we actually have people coming in um, before um, to do a lot of, you know, to answer questions about how to vote, especially when you have new citizens, who this is going to be their first time, maybe they're older. So we usually do a lot of training. It just means that we're going to, um, expand our training, our, our education in this regards and in this process. Um, and so we also think that we need to um, hold accountable, you know, uh, in terms of if our um, participation is so decreased, and we need to 
hold our electeds accountable to these decisions because it means that we're not being um, included. But we oh. believe that by mail is a safer place, a safer way to vote. But it's good. We, we also don't want that to then have consequences that are not just for the Latino community, but for the entire country. If our folks aren't able to get um, to exercise their um, democratic right. Wonderful. It's, it's so important that we continue uh, to educate and do that outreach. And I know this is challenging with the new possible changes to voting systems, not only were the vote centers new here in Los Angeles, but now as we try to lean more heavily on vote by mail, we'll need to do more of that outreach. Well, I want to transition to another topic that I know both of your organizations are involved in and it's happening right now, and that's the census. Um, what are each of your organizations doing uh, now, given the uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, we've seen data on lower than uh, desired response rates in many of our immigrant communities on the internet portion of the census. Um, what do we need to do and what are we doing uh, in order to try to increase census participation, which I understand has been extended a little bit and there'll be additional uh, field time. Um, but that also gets back to civic engagement and community participation. We really only have one chance for this until 10 years from now. Um, I'll start on Helica with you since you were just up uh, on the monitor. Um, tell me what Chirla is doing and, and why census participation is so important for our immigrant yeah. communities. Well, number one, um, we transferred all our engagement to um, virtual online on phone. So all our folks who were supposed to be in the field, we kept them on and actually expanded their time to be on the phones and to have those one on one conversations, especially in some very targeted areas where we saw that the response rate was was extremely low. Um, and so that, you know, that continues. Um, this weekend, for example, we're doing a concert with um, Latino TV, as well as mm -hmm. with um, uh, Estrella TV. It's gonna be telecast and its title is Cuídate y Cuéntate. So we talk about obviously Cuídate, which is our health, our health in this moment of COVID-19 where Latinos mm -hmm. and immigrants are so heavily impacted, but also connecting that to the Cuéntate message and really getting a lot of um, um, star, you know, artists uh, to echo that message. This concert was supposed to be in, you know, a big as part of Fiesta Broadway. Um, we've gone to a little bit of a mini concert in the virtual realm, but we feel that that education, that constant um, reminder is important. And um, it's just, we have to do as much as we can in order to be counted. That's great, and I'm glad that your uh, efforts are ongoing, even though it's a challenging time. Uh, Jenny, uh, you spoke about the census as well. Uh, what is on Ultimate's plate as it relates to the census? Yeah, I mean, the census is imperative to our community. If, if the pandemic is not wiping us out, you know, having a low count census um, is really going to be detrimental um, to all of our community members. So. Um, we have been having promotoras at all of our clinic sites. Um, we stopped that for the last two months um, because of COVID-19, but we moved them all to the phone. So we have 35 organizers calling our patients and community members um, as we speak, walking them through the, through the census. So as of last night, we have called over 1.2 million families. Now, these are the hardest to count families. These are, these are um, amazing you know, numbers that we're able to reach. Um, again, because we're the trusted mes messenger, Matt, and when you see, you know, a caller ID that says Altamed, um, you're going to most likely answer it, right? Because you're like, oh, my doctor's calling. I wonder, you know, I don't have an appointment. I wonder what's happening. And then we get you with the census. Um, come next month and in the next two weeks, now that um, we have enough PPE equipment for our promotoras and we're taking measures to make sure everybody is safe, we're gonna start opening the kiosk again at all of our clinics um, so that when patients are there waiting for their doctor's appointment, we're able to help them fill out their census while they're there. And I think that's that's really been the game changer for us and getting a really high turnout of people to fill it out is that someone is actually there that they trust with their information that support them and walk them through the process. Um, and if we're gonna get you know, an accurate count in LA County, it's gonna be by that. It's gonna be by trusted messengers actually you know, helping our community do the work because this is new to a lot of us. This is new, the electronic version, obviously it's new to everyone, but filling out the census is new to a lot of our community members. 
I want to um, transition to talk about the climate that we're in and what is happening with immigration, um, the public charge with uh, deportations, lack of access to the first stimulus. Uh, but before I get there with that question for each of you, we've had two questions come in through the chat for both of your organizations uh, saying, how can I get involved? How can I help? And it looks like um, you know there's a lot of folks here who I think are really supportive and encouraged by the work that both Altamen and Chirla is doing. So Jenny, while I have you up, why don't you uh, tell us where we can go to the website or a number to call or how can other folks, whether they're um, immigration attorneys, whether they want to donate time, money, assistance, whatever, uh, how can we get involved to support the efforts that Altamen is doing? Well, this is great. This makes me so happy, um, especially that we have folks that are interested in the work that we're doing. So the, the easiest way to, to, to support our work is to log on to My Vote, My How. And this is where we update all of our community members and advocates on the policies that are important, but we also have action items. So action regarding public charge or regarding the community and school first proposition. Um, and we can you know send you what elected officials you need to reach out to, or maybe come and phone bank with us on one evening. So we encourage you to go on our website, My Vote, My Health, um, and download our app. All right, wonderful, thank you. And Helica, and how can we get involved with Cherla and support the efforts uh, that Cherla has been doing? So we have over a thousand volunteers um, every election um, day, I mean, every election season. So we really wanna make sure that you get involved. Um, right now, you can go to www.cherla.org um, and then just um, go to the volunteer section and, and sign up. Um, and I would actually hold up just a little bit. Our, our, um, our website is being impacted because we are part of the disaster relief program. Um, and I would actually invite you to sign up as a volunteer and also sign up for the I Am California, Yo Soy California mm -hmm. campaign because actually civic engagement is not just going to the polls. It's also being active in um, moving forward with our, uh, our policy demands once you know our folks are elected. So there is a, a petition um, to ensure that immigrants are included. Um, and um, now that they have been elected, that now they respond to the immigrant community. Yeah. So please, please join us on um, for our, our election campaign. Well, I read an article about that uh, yesterday, I think, actually. It said that Chirla has gotten over a million calls uh, yesterday alone uh, as the Resilience Fund opened up. Uh, and that's a good segue to what will be our sort of final topic to think about. Um, what is uh, Chirla doing? Can you tell us a little bit more about the California Resilience Fund and how undocumented communities who were blatantly left out of the first CARES Act uh, stimulus bill, how California has stepped up and what Cherla's role is in that. Okay. Um, so first and foremost, I think uh, just to begin by saying, please do become part of the Yo Soy California, I Am California campaign because it actually has demands on the local, at the state and at the federal level for full inclusion of immigrants um, and that we should actually recognize the undocumented as residents for the purposes of accessing um, safe, the safety net and also economic relief. That has not happened. And because that had not happened, and because of all the pressure of community-based organizations, philanthropy, as well as our Latino elected officials, the governor created a $75 million um, dollar fund called the Disaster Relief um, Assistance um, Program for Immigrants. Um, that was then matched by philanthropy um, through the Grant Makers Concern for Immigrant Rights that joined, you know, created a fund, the California Resilience Fund, um, which seeks to uh, fundraise $50 million. Um, the program provides, um, it's, it's um, the $75 million um, actually helps 150,000 individuals, which is only 6% of really the entire um, eligible undocumented community in California, which is about 2.5 million um, who would need mm -hmm. this, this support. And, um, and then, um, and so we're helping people um, get, you know, get this, um, this assistance the first day we had um, 1.1,137,000 uh, calls. Um, that was the same yesterday, uh, but I think wow. between our partners, and Asians Advancing Justice, we've already helped in, in, in two days, um, 3,000, over 3,000 individuals, 3,164, I know these numbers. Um, and that's $1.5 million um, dollars to people. Um, so it's it's been, you know, we're running the program, um, but it's been very frustrating on the other side because the demand is so high. 
And so then the response, of course, you know, we're doing as much as we can to um, get as much of the um, aid as possible. But this is all happening because the federal government left our people out and not just immigrants who paid taxes, but also their U.S. citizen and legal permanent resident families. And this is not fair. And so the other thing people can do is advocate at the federal level that our immigrants are included and at the state level that we continue to um, provide assistance, access to unemployment benefits, access to food stamps, access to all the things that other Californians have in the middle of a pandemic and our folks cannot be left out. Thank you for that uh, work, Angelica. I, I know I've been seeing the, the news coverage of both Chirla and Karesan and Asian Americans Advancing Justice are really uh, doing important work in helping with that fund, and I know that you'll continue to do that. Um, and we'll hope that the next bill, the HEROES Act, is more inclusive of undocumented communities. Uh, Jenny, let me turn to you with just the last two minutes uh, and gain your reactions. I know Ultimate is continuing to provide health services amidst this public charge when immigrants were being warned not to go and sign up for social services. What, what ha uh, problems or difficulties has that created for Ultimate and how has Ultimate been able to continue to gain the trust of immigrants during this uh, time? Yeah, I mean, public charge was, is, is very detrimental to not just our immigrant community, but but the welfare and health being of the entire community. Um, because if one of us is sick, then you know the chance of somebody else getting sick is then amplified. Um, what we are doing is, you know, we've been doing this work for 50 years, Matt. So the community really has a high trust level with us. So we have been here, um, and we're, our doors are open to service anyone who needs any medical attention or support or has questions, um, regardless of people's immigration status. And right now, especially, regardless of people's ability to pay. Um, so our doors are open, not just you know for COVID-19, but for vaccinations or chronic illness management. Um, we are still promoting that. And you know we know that there's gonna be some difficult decisions in the Supreme Court, and we're gonna be doing whatever needs to happen to make sure that our community stays protected. And we're a FQHC, so we're a fairly qualified health center, mm -hmm. which means our locations are safe. Um, you know, nobody can get access to our patient information, um, obviously through HIPAA, um, but, but, but at a higher level because we're an FQHC. Um, so we feel we're a safe space and we want to just emphasize that our community health centers are, are, uh, are open and available to help out those are in our most vulnerable community members. Great, thank you, and thanks to the work that Ultimate has been doing, as you mentioned, for 50 years in the community, really a trusted voice uh, alongside Chirla. I wanna thank both uh, Jenny Carrion, Angelica Salas, two amazing uh, Latina leaders in our community who are in uh, the immigrant community, in the Latino community, uh, working every day with their organizations to lift up our voices and provide opportunities. Um, so thank you both for joining us. Uh, just in conclusion, uh, we wanna thank everyone for joining this webinar today. Um, the summit will continue. The Luskin Summit will continue with more virtual sessions once or twice a week between now and mid-June. But before we sign off, I wanna pass along a few words from Keenan Burley, the Executive Vice President at Westminster Financial Capital and an alum of the UCLA School of Law. Uh, he is a member of the Board of Advisors of the Luskin School and on the committee that helped put this Luskin Summit together. Here now is Keenan Burley. Thank you again for joining our virtual Luskin Summit. We're glad to be able to connect with you despite the extraordinary circumstances we all currently face. I'm a member of the UCLA Luskin Board uh, for the School of Public Affairs and a member of the Luskin Summit Committee. Through my involvement with the Luskin School, I'm continuously impressed by the great work that is done by the faculty and students. And I think today's presentation is a further demonstration of Luskin's impact on the community. We hope you became more informed of the pressing needs of Los Angeles County and came away with ideas on solutions and action steps to these issues today. Please be on the lookout for a post-event survey we greatly appreciate your feedback on the sessions. You can also use the poll to let us know what topics you would like us to address in future events. 
I invite you to continue your engagement with the Luskin School through attending future events, supporting our faculty and students, or sharing our great work with others in the community. Please be our advocates so we can find further solutions for the issues that were discussed today. Luskin has created an emergency fund to support students who are experiencing financial hardship that adversely affects their success at UCLA. A UCLA Luskin board member has funded a match and we greatly appreciate your support in meeting that match. We appreciate your support for our community partners who gen generously sponsored this series and our dedicated Luskin board members who served on the planning committee. Thanks again for joining us. Have a wonderful day. We hope you can attend the next Luskin Summit session. Bye now.